All right, live from Salt Lake City, this is Heart of the Matter, where we do all we can to worship God in spirit and in truth. And uh, I'm Sean McCraney, your host, sitting here with an esteemed guest. Let's begin with a word of prayer. Lord, we just pray that you'll bless the time Richard and I have together to talk openly and, uh, and help uh, the words he has to say reach people uh, and, and touch them for your purposes. We pray that um, you'll be with our audience who uh, tunes in, is watching and seeking and trying to understand life and the things about it relative to, in this case, leaving the Mormon church and what happens thereafter. We love you and seek you in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Number one, open water baptisms and hot, wa hot water hot dog extravaganza Sunday, August 20th, 2017 from 11.30 a.m. To 1.30 p.m., all are welcome. You don't have to be baptized or eat hot dogs, but come. Number two, we are having guests over the course of the next uh, month and a half, two months nearly. And, uh, of course, we have uh, our guest tonight, and I'm really excited about this. Next week will be Dave Bartosowitz. You know Dave from his 300-plus uh, videos online and uh, maybe in other ways, too. And then Delaney McCraney is going to be my guest on August 22nd, my youngest daughter, who went to four years of a Christian school, a very strict Christian school, and uh, look forward to hearing what she has to say about that. She has changed. Uh, so tune in for those exciting guests. And also, uh, Heart of the Matter is, has surrendered. We are on Facebook now. Just uh, search, do a search for Heart of the Matter. You'll see my mug. That's our page. We're also officially on Twitter. So finally, we've been having guests who have been LDS, and who have gone on to do something else. Uh, they don't necessarily embrace evangelicalism. They don't necessarily become Buddhist. They become all sorts of things and have all kinds of views. And let me just tell you, going back to the year 2000, uh, I was living in Huntington Beach with my wife. I had come to know the Lord in 97. It's been three years. I'm still LDS uh, attending. And uh, one evening, my wife and I decided to go to the movies. And I had heard about this movie that was out. Uh, by an LDS a director named Richard Dutcher. And so my wife and I went to the Fashion Island Cinemas, that's in Newport Beach, very swanky place, and, uh, and we went in and we watched the movie, and I was very impressed, of course, with uh, the technical stuff, and I was impressed with the story and, and the acting, all the technical and things that come to making a film, I was impressed. But I think I had an edge uh, against the Mormon side to it, to be honest with you. Um, jump forward some 13 or so years, I'm in downtown uh, Salt Lake City, I'm eating dinner, a hamburger, it's early evening, but it's darker, and I'm in this restaurant alone with another guy, and I look at this other guy closely, and I say, uh, you look like Richard Dutcher. And you know, like Jesus to the Pharisees, he said, I am. <laughs> and uh, so I, I tried to, he's, he's really actually kind of shy, and I kind of started talking to him, and he gave me his email address. A couple years pass, and I have that email address in my wallet, and we were kind of dabble around in different art things here, and we had some script, and, and I thought, maybe I can contact Richard Dutcher, and he could give me some advice. So we met for dinner, and we started talking about, nothing really materialized with that, but what did materialize was a, a friendship. And, you know, in time, we hung out in different situations, and. Uh, over time, I got to know uh, Richard personally. We've, we've been to dinner uh, uh, a number of times and been to the bar uh, a couple times. And uh, Richard speaks to my person in a couple of ways. Uh, first, he does have a very keen sense about the things of God. Um, you can see that when you watch his films, uh, which are excellent. But uh, paradoxically, he has the ability to tap into my flesh like no other, and makes me laugh. Uh, rarely do I laugh as much with other people as I do with Richard uh, Dutcher. It's, it's frankly otherworldly. It's probably netherworldly, <laughs> but nevertheless, uh, it is there. Uh, we are kindred spirits in many ways. Uh, so I'm going to try to keep that side of the relationship out of this a lot. He's probably going to try to bring it in a lot, so this will be interesting. Uh, Richard's cinematic accomplishments as a writer, director, producer of films. He's acted in all the films I'm going to mention except for one. He has uh, uh, written, produced, and uh, directed Girl Crazy, his first, 
God's Army, the movie I just talked about, Brigham City, uh, States of Grace, also known as God's Army 2, which was very powerful. I love that. Falling, Evil Angel, and he's in post-production on a number of other films. He's from Illinois originally, served an LDS mission. He knows his stuff, of course, relative to filmmaking. I would like in my, just to sit here and pick his mind about his experiences. It's fascinating about what he knows and what he's seen in making movies. But we're about Richard Dutcher having been LDS, growing up, coming out, and what's happened to him in his life since that time relative to God, religion, whatever. Welcome, Richard Dutcher. Thank you, Sean McCraney. Thank you for being on the show. <laughs> You're welcome, thanks uh, for having me. Okay, go back and tell us about the man I read about named Richard Hill. Oh, okay. Well, first I want to go back to the hamburger story because oh, uh, I remember it, it a little bit differently because I remember being in line and some guy just started, he said, hey, you look like Richard Dutcher and I didn't want to talk to you. <laughs> and I, I remember just being like, ugh. And I remember, saying, I remember saying something like, yeah, I get that a lot and, you know, he was my skinny little brother or some nonsense like that, you know. Um, but then you kept pressing. It's like, no, you could tell that I was just, you know, BSing, and so you pressed it, and so finally I had to admit it. So, but uh, I do not remember that. This guy has a fanciful <laughs> imagination. I swear, his response was, "I am." Oh, nonsense! Yeah, <laughs> yeah that's just like me. To, you know. All right. Um, okay, but uh, Richard Hill. Well, yeah. So I was born uh, Richard Hill, no middle name. My dad didn't like middle names, um, and that, and I wasn't born in, into the Mormon faith at all. I was born in Chicago. And my father was an atheist, but his family was Baptist. My grandparents, my paternal grandparents, were very active in their Baptist um, church in Chicago, Maywood. And, uh, and then my mother's family was Pentecostal. And so I grew up with those two influences, the Baptists on the father's side, the Pentecostal on the mother's side. Mostly I'd attend the Pentecostal church with my grandmother and grew up there. And it's really fascinating, when I was a kid, uh, a lot of stuff I didn't really realize that I was absorbing until later when I was, you know, active LDS, but I saw things differently. Um, but uh, one of the things I remember as a kid was I'd, ha I'd, I w I'd have to go to Bible study camp every, sun every summer, mm. and uh, my grandma would take me. And I remember uh, I, didn't really, I didn't really connect with the Pentecostal um, Aesthetic, I guess, is a good way of putting it. It scared me as a kid. Uh, you know, my grandpa, who I loved, you know, but was a very stoic, very serious man. Um, he was a bricklayer by trade. And but, you know, when it was on, uh, you know, when the spirit would hit, and he would suddenly be speaking in tongues, and he would be doing the Chuck Berry down the aisle. You know, this is, and he had a bad back, but, you know, suddenly when he got the spirit, he would be just dancing and jumping and and uh, scared me as a kid, you know, and all the, and I was always a pretty reserved, kind of in, intellectually oriented kind of kid. And so to me, I didn't really fit. And I remember being, you know, Jesus to me was the strange, he's, you know, he had sandals and he was in some other part of the country a long time ago. And, and I just didn't really um, have a connection. And, and so Mormonism came along because my mother, my mother and father divorced when I was about six, and then when I was about seven, some Mormon guy came through town, a businessman, <clears throat> and started boinking the women in our little southern Utah town. And I guess my mom, <laughs> hope my mom's not watching, but, uh, and, uh, um, <laughs> sorry mom, she won, I guess, the, the contest, and so, or lost, as it turned out. Um, but so we, we all were kind of adopted into Mormonism by the, the boinking, traveling Mormon wow. businessman. Um, and uh, I, always, I always get myself in trouble on these things. I'm enjoying um, this. All right. Um, so I, and and it, it, it appealed to me as a kid, because I remember going, you know, the first time to a, it was a little, you know, Mount Vernon, Illinois, it was a little, it was, we were meeting in an old, it wasn't a house, it might have been an old funeral parlor or something, but, um, not a dedicated, it was a branch of the LDS church, not a ward, and so it was just a rented building. And, um, but it was all, you know, it, it, you know, there was a lot, it was a lot more 
of a an intellectual approach to religion than I was used to growing up, and so I, as being a more quiet, introverted kind of kid, or, or I I took to it. You know, it was like I, you know, it felt it didn't scare me. You know, mm -hmm. and it was like okay, I I I like this. Um, but then the whole time I was growing up, of course, whenever I would, you know, I'd go to church with my grandma as well. So I I was still a part of the Pentecostal community, but grew up in Mormonism, mm -hmm. and. Uh, but when my mother married the, the Mormon, his name was Dutcher, and so that's where I, I was adopted against my will <laughs> as a, a child. And so I, I became, that's, that was my name. When did you move out here? Moved out here to go to, well, in high school. Moved mm -hmm. out here in high school. My sophomore year in high school, my, uh, my stepfather and mother moved here, and uh, that was my introduction to Utah. And I actually loved it. I loved the, you know, loved the, I love Utah. I love the mountains. I love the climate. I love, you know, I just love it mm -hmm. here. Um, I did find it interesting because I'm kind of a non, I'm just a nonconformist. You may have noticed this. but Slightly. But uh, I, you know, whatever a group's doing is I want to be doing something else. Mm -hmm. And so I've noticed because I've come, I've, I've lived in Utah and I always found it hard to be a Mormon in Utah because I just naturally don't want to do, I just, you know, whatever the group's doing, I don't want to do it. Mm -hmm. um, strange but true and so I was a great Mormon in California mm. because you know I could be a I was different you know I was different and it was okay but uh, for some reason the my, my psychology doesn't mesh with with the majority was that the way it was Brigham Young BYU years no same way at BYU I as soon as I, I after my mission I went to Brigham Young University and quickly became inactive <laughs> an inactive wow. Mormon huh. and was constantly dogged by the standard I almost got kicked out of BYU <laughs> um, because I was attracted to women which was <laughs> crazy how dare you yeah uh, that's a whole other story we can do but um, but yeah so I in fact my last year of B, by BYU they started doing those ridiculous ecclesiastical endorsements they call them oh, where yeah. you have to get signed off that you're a good good uh, active participating latter-day saint to keep going to school mm -hmm. and uh, that irritated me to such a degree that I had to quickly finish my studies and get out because I just didn't didn't respond well to that you so know. you've always been against the, the man fight yeah, against the man. the man I'm always you know fight the man that's what'd uh, you study BYU film film yeah. Yeah. And uh, tell us about then what happened in personal life, film, L.A. Yeah, well, since I was a kid, I wanted to make films. I always knew that. And so for me, it was like film and, and, uh, and Mormonism eventually became a really central part. Well, obviously, well, that's something that Mormonism does. But, I, you know, I thought a lot about this and how, you know, as a little boy, you know, as a boy in, in um, southern Illinois, and being given this narrative, you know, I, I've thought about that a lot afterwards. It's like, why, why did it, because I think, I think, you know, if I had never, if the traveling salesman hadn't come through town, and I didn't know about Mormonism until I was 19 or 20, and missionaries knocked on my door, I think I would have just laughed and, mm -hmm. you know, thought this is ridiculous. Mm -hmm. But, because I was so young and brought into it, but I've thought about the narrative of Mormonism, you know, this, you know, this, this pioneer boy, you know, and, and seeing God and Jesus and creating this world religion and mm -hmm. you know there's just something that really responds to that a, a young boy responds to this narrative and I certainly did I remember going out and praying you know we lived in Kentucky at the time had the woods behind our house you know and I'm you know 12 and 13 and going out in the woods praying trying to have an experience wow. like Joseph Smith had yeah. you know um, that kind of thing you know because I was I, I really it, the the narrative really resonated with me so wait, before we go into the college and um, family and things, 12 years old, Kentucky, you are, you have a heart for God. Yeah. Your grandfather, yeah. your, some of the religious uh, upbringing helped and all that, but y you've always had some heart for God. Yeah, yeah, I can't, um, I can't remember a time that I didn't. Wow. Um, and I can't remember a, uh, I was always very sensitive to to religion and spirituality, and I I don't know if that was something that was just in me or if it's something that my grandparents, um, my, like I said, my father, who I barely knew, wasn't, you know, didn't believe at all, and um, my stepfather I wasn't close to. My mother was 
religious, but so I don't I don't know where it came from, but I always um, felt a relationship. With, well, actually, I do. That's the interesting thing about having left Mormonism now for you know it's been over a decade now that I've had time to really, with some objectivity and perspective, think a lot about it, and uh, and I realize that uh, and one of the reasons it was so crushing to me when I realized that Mormonism wasn't true was uh, you know my my father leaving when I was six and I only saw him a couple more times before he died um, when I was in my you know when I was 40 so I barely knew my father my stepfather was distant and I and I I connected with my that whole you know the way that God is presented in Mormonism as Heavenly Father mm. and so to me I really um, allowed myself to be adopted, you know, and so I looked, you know, when I would pray, I was talking to my father, my real father. In fact, that's a line in God's Army, I just realized, you know, and the, my, the character that I play is talking, kids talking about his father, and I said something about your real father, mm -hmm. referring to God, and that's the way that I saw it, and so when, uh, when I broke with Mormonism, it was, which was right before my actual father died, it was a very difficult time because I, you know, I really felt I'd lost both my fathers. Wow. Yeah. And that I hadn't known either one of them, really. Wow. You know? yeah. So uh, bring us through. Graduate from uh, BYU film and you start on your career. Did you meet uh, Gwen in college or was it before? Or? I met my, uh, my wife, now my ex-wife. I met her in, um, at BYU, yeah. Uh -huh. my, near, my, last, my last year of school. Mm -hmm. and it was a great romance, and uh, we got married quickly and ran off to Los Angeles to, you know, get my career started. Mm -hmm. And, uh, uh, yeah, so great marriage, great. We, we have several amazing kids. And, mm -hmm. um, I've talked to Richard privately. Uh, he, he comes around. I go over to his place sometimes over the years, a couple years now, I think, and... Uh, he is always, even though he's divorced now, he has always spoke highly of Gwen as uh, being his true love of his life and of being a great mother and a great wife. And it really was a great relationship. So even though, you know, that, that says something because a lot of people bag on the ex really heavily and that's all they kind of do. And that's not Dutcher. That says a lot to me. So you, you're making films now. I know yeah. I'm covering a lot of ground. Yeah, yeah. I'm trying to get to what might be the most interesting thing. But but the in the condensed version was I found my first film had nothing to do with Mormonism, and I was just trying to, you know, make a career for myself. Didn't find it satisfying. And then I came upon this idea of doing the film God's Army and creating what I envisioned as Mormon cinema being, you know, at that time I was thinking, you know, Mormons have a fantastic opportunity because filmmakers just aren't interested, generally speaking, in spiritual subject right. matter. Sometimes they're interested in religious, but usually those are crappy filmmakers who are using that as a gimmick to sell their junk, you mm -hmm. know. And, but I was thinking, you know, if Mormons got together and, and could create, you know, quality, thought-provoking, you know, reach into the depths of faith and, and, you know, that in short order they could become the, you know, whenever somebody would think about spirituality in film, they would think about the Mormons. Mm. So that's what I started. And they mm. killed it, you know, <laughs> pretty quickly with their, you know, poor quality films. But that's what, but it, but for a short time there, I was able to combine my two passions, you know, filmmaking and, and I was, and the filmmaking, because of the subjects that I was choosing, was informing my spiritual growth and evolution and vice versa. You know, my spiritual growth was informing the kind of films that I wanted to make and it was this symbiotic relationship that was amazing and yeah. satisfying. And But what I didn't see coming was, uh, well, after I made my film Brigham City, and it was really well received critically, and um, uh, and I was succeeding. I'd done what I wanted in creating Mormon cinema. The other guys hadn't come in and destroyed it yet, and uh, and I realized that I wanted to make my magnum opus what I thought would be my magnum opus, which was the life of Joseph Smith. And I'd been always studying his life, but I really, at that point, I, I had the opportunity, so I delved into the you know in-depth research of uh, um, of the life of Joseph Smith, 
which eventually led me through a lot of, you know, a lot of uh, introspection and, you know, trying to reason things out and prayerfully approaching things. And uh, it led me, ironically, it led me to my moment of realization that it wasn't true. Mm -hmm. So, so uh, filmmaking actually, <laughs> I, I wonder sometimes, you know, it's to me, it, ex it certainly accelerated. I might have ended up being a 50, 60 year old Mormon man, so busy being whatever I, else I was that I never, but, but my career choice and my success allowed me to like go so, be so focused about it that I was able to get through that tunnel. Wow. And uh, so spiritual filmmaking led me out of the church in a way. Uh, you can get uh, Brigham City, States of Grace, God's Army in the Richard Dutcher collection, three part, it's cheaper this way. Uh, we're gonna show the graphic on uh, the screen of where to get it. Uh, just to let you know, it says here, Michael Medved, a big name in re uh, Hollywood movies, reviews, all that. He says, quote, Dutcher is a wonder kind of truly terrifying potential. And then uh, another quote says here from Wade Major of Box Office Magazine, quote, Dutcher has joined the ranks of the very best independent filmmakers in the world, end quote. Uh, pretty honorable and really renowned and uh, doing his thing and very independent, mi independently minded. This guy will tell you when he thinks something's BS. He really does. And he went the independent route and he expressed everything independently you can sense it through God's army you can sense his trying to be honest with God and his religion so you study Joseph Smith you're gonna you're, you want to do the story the epic story of Joseph Smith and then what's what happened well it, it, that combined with uh, I was I was I had taken Mormonism to its well, you know, when most we were just talking about this today because of the general authority that that was excommunicated and people are all talking about it and I'm not interested. I don't care what he did and, you know, I it's did. none of my business. I'm totally so. interested. But uh, and well, and when I left, um, you know, there are all these rumors about I was telling you there's all these rumors about why, you know, I had I actually had a I I had the opportunity which very few people get when they leave Mormonism, but I I was asked by the Daily Herald to write an article, so I, you know, the whole back page of the front section of the newspaper was me saying, "I'm out of here," <laughs> you know, and uh, that was big news. Yeah, but it was interesting because even though I just plainly said that I, you know, don't that I don't believe and that I have problems theologically with the church, and I I refuse to pretend to believe anymore, people had to come up with, you know, there's there had to be a sin of some sort, so. You know, there was, I was, uh, the, my favorite one was that I was gay, which was like, okay, well, that's interesting. You know, and the adultery, the gay, the drug addiction, and, um, and the simple fact was I stopped believing. Mm -hmm. And what was interesting to me was uh, I stopped, you know, my, uh, uh, my moment of realization, it came to me in an instant, uh, um, and I, I, I've talked about this on Mormon Stories and on Bishop Earl's program, so I don't want to go into that. Um, but, but it happened at the moment when I was living as, you know, under, uh, in Mormon standards, as worthy or as pure, wow. as dedicated of a life as I ever had. Mm -hmm. You know, I, in fact, I, I was so into Mormonism that I was, you know, and into the history because of all the studying that I'd done, not just Joseph Smith, but Brigham Young and all the, you know, the Adam God theory and all the, and I was going to the temple and I was listening and, and, you know, and, uh, and, you know, and I started to understand what Brigham Young said about, you know, the purposes of the signs and tokens in the temple and, and using those to make contact with the, mm. with the, to reach beyond the veil and to get your questions answered. And I was doing it. I was trying. You know, I'd be in my home, in my room with the door closed, you know, doing the secret, the true order of prayer wow. and trying to, and nothing ever happened, you know. And, mm. and even though I was doing every, I mean, it was like, you know, check go down the, it's like there's no reason that I can't be getting the results that Brigham Young and Joseph Smith said I mm -hmm. should be getting and at the same time promising God that whatever the answers were to my questions I would do it you know mm -hmm. I mean I was at that point where and I was seeing this this fork in the road coming where it was like I was seeing 
from everything that I learned that there was a fork coming up in the road where it was going to be fundamentalism. Mm. You know, it's going to be Mormon fundamentalism because that's when you get to a certain point, you realize that the teachings, the 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 uh, contemporary teachings of the church, do not, are not at all compatible with the with the foundational teachings of Joseph Smith and Brigham Young, and so it's like at a certain point you realize, well, the early church is true, or it's not true at all, yeah. and maybe you you know. So I was seeing myself coming to this point where it's like, am I going to become a fundamentalist? Mm. Or am I going to um, um, pretend to, you know, to just stay in Mormonism because I had a career and a reputation and respect and money and and a family and or uh, or is it just not true at all? And that's when it hit me that, you know, it, it was after prayer. I'll, I'll give the brief version, but I was actually in my room <clears throat> and I'd been praying about you know why you know what what's where is it and for the first time since I was like 14 years old I asked in my mind I wasn't even asking in prayer but just to myself for the first time I suddenly asked myself the question what if it's all just not true and that voice you know that you, in Mormonism especially you're always there you're always kind of programmed to think of answers coming from mm -hmm. from outside but this was a voice that was, and it was, it's, I hate to, it's indescribable, but it was like as clear as anything I have ever heard in my life. Mm. And I knew that it was, my, it was me, but it was something so deep down inside me that it was like, you know, that my core speaking to me and saying, and of course it isn't true. And it was just an instantaneous everything was gone and it was it was one of the, it was probably the most terrifying moment of my life because up until that exact moment i believed i knew what the universe was my place in it mm. i knew who god was i knew how the world worked i knew what was right what was wrong and then suddenly at that moment literally 3 seconds later i was in a new universe where nothing i knew nothing mm. and uh and the only thing i knew was that it wasn't true and I knew it, and I knew, and, and it was like, I, I, the best description I can have of it was, I, it was like I could, I was sitting in my bed with my back against the wall, and it was like my, I could feel my belief, my faith. It, w it was like those science fiction movies, you know, where you see the two ships and they separate and, you know, they're just being pulled apart in space, and one's going to drift off, and it's never coming back, it's yeah. gone, you know. And, and you just sit there, and it was like that. It was like, I, it was like literally watching my, and feeling my, my faith just wow. drift away and knowing that it was never coming back. Was this post uh, the article in the paper or? Uh, no, that was, that was before, that was wow. about two years before wow. because I, you know, it took me a while to kind of process things and to figure out where, you know, what did this mean and how do I, and I, you know, the weird thing is after that happens, you have to keep functioning, you have to keep, making a living for your family you have to keep mm -hmm. you know and it's it's I, I, I've talked to other people who just kind of gradually come to this place where they don't believe anymore they never really believed and mm -hmm. but to me it was like it was just this literally like stepping into another reality wow. and suddenly uh, and having to continue to function and appear normal I had employees you know I had you know a dozen employees and and my kids and uh, so how did it kind of unravel over time and what was the end result from the Mormon community in your life your views re regarding God well everything was uh, um, the interesting things were where there was uh, I realized that it was so hard even though I knew I, mean, I absolutely knew and I know to this day and you asked me one time you're like we were talking about things and you said you asked me if I would ever go back mm -hmm. and it was like there's no possible way that I could conceive of going back because I'm on, you know, I, I absolutely know that it's, that it's not real. Um, but even after uh, having that, you've got, and uh, someone re in a review in one of my films in a newspaper, I think in LA, a guy re referred to, he said, religion has got, t it's like had talons in my brain. Mm. And I love that because it was, it, that's, it was like, that is exactly how I feel it. Mm. And there were times afterwards where, uh, 
where even though I knew that it wasn't real, I had to, you know, you're, you've been trained and conditioned to see things a certain way and to believe things. And, you know, even afterwards, you're like, I don't believe this stuff anymore, but am I the link that's the broken link in, in eternities and the rest of my posterity are going to be damned because of the choices that I make and all this bullshit, you know? Mm -hmm. Um, but it's still in your head, and uh, it's so hard to get free of that. And I did, and I won't talk on this show about how I did it, but um, whew, but because uh, nobody would understand. But um, but I but having to to get free of that. In fact, in my film Falling, which was a um, I consider it the, my best film, um, and I made it shortly after my realization that I, w I made it in the midst of this incredible crisis that I was in. Um, but it was interesting. There's a scene where my character is, uh, the character that I'm playing is at a really awful moment in his life and he puts a gun in his mouth and he pulls off to the side of the road, he puts a gun in his mouth. And, uh, and I knew how, as a director and as a screenwriter, I knew how that scene needed to play. You know, that, you know the emotions that my character would have to come up with. And I knew it needed to be just this, this incredible scene, and uh, and and I, as an actor, you think about how you're going to get there. You know, different different ways that you could get to the emotion that needs to be there. And uh, I didn't really think about it until the morning that I had to shoot the scene, and then I realized that that I I had to go home after I finished this shoot. I was in L.A. and my family was here, and my son. Eli was about to be baptized, and I was expected to baptize him. Um, the whole family, of course, everybody, the community, and you know, he, my son, was expecting me to baptize him, and I knew that I had to go home and tell everybody, I don't believe, and I'm not going to, ba I'm not going to, I can't, I couldn't do that. I couldn't, in good conscience, perform a baptism that I, that I didn't, I couldn't, you know, pretend with my son in the water and perform. It was like seemed like the height of hypocrisy and just it seemed profane to do it. Anyway, but I knew that I was going to have to go and sit down with my son. And exp try to find a way to explain that. And uh, you can see. Yeah. And so I, you know, as soon as I started to think about that, I just kind of shut it off and was like, okay, and then, you know, roll camera, I pulled up and I pulled the gun out and I just thought about that and bam, you wow. know, it was like the most powerful scene I've ever performed. Mm -hmm. And uh, it turned out to be an incredible scene, but, uh, but that's the kind of thing that, you know, that's the kind of thing that I was trying to release myself from that, you know, and... Uh, and then when I, when I left, it was interesting what finally prompted me to be public about it. The, the Daily Herald had actually act, they, they wanted me to write an article on the state of Mormon cinema at the time. And I didn't want to write it. I was like, I was so sick of Mormon cinema at this time, you know, because they just killed this beautiful, this beautiful possibility potential with all their shitty films. <laughs> um, and, uh, um, but right before that, I was at a restaurant and uh, I didn't believe anymore, but I wasn't, hadn't been public about it because I'd been processing it through my family and, and myself. And I, I just had a glass of red wine, so I was drinking, and I happened to look over. It was at a restaurant in Sandy, and I looked over, and I noticed this man was giving me this look. Clearly, had recognized me when we walked in and had been watching me as I was eating and then saw me drinking this wine and realized that and he, the look was just this, you know, judgment, contempt, and and I realized that it was like I'm, you know, I'm not a hypocrite. In fact, I'm, you know, I, I was willing to leave everything because I didn't believe anymore. But but in his eyes, I'm sure he thought that I was a hypocrite. And it was like at that point I realized. And then right after that, I was walking down the store, and some lady came up and started talking to me about how made, you know, how. Her, my film, God's Army, made her son go on a mission and started telling me all these experiences. And, and I was polite, and, but at the same time, I realized that people were, people believed me to be somebody that I no longer was. And that's why when I talked to the Daily Herald and I said, well, I'm not, I don't want to write about Mormon cinema, but I'm leaving Mormonism. Can I write about that? Mm. And they were like, yeah. Mm. <laughs> yeah, newspaper. <laughs> it's like, okay, good. 
Um, Front page. We'll get to. <laughs> Um, we, uh, sorry, Richard. We uh, we talk about every time we open the show of uh, worshiping God in spirit and in truth, and you know we all have something to lose when we leave Mormonism. Everybody who's gone, and uh, it's one of the things that gets my ire up about what the church does when it mind screws people so badly that they they really fall apart in many different ways. But you know, very few of us made a name as you know the father of mormon cinema and 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 then walk away from that he could have i'm sure continued on a life of being the guy who does mormon movies mm -hmm. i'm sure you could have been fat dumb and happy obviously you're only, you're not i was going to make a really bad joke <laughs> <laughs> not fat anymore you're not so i can't <laughs> use that uh, but you know he ha he has laid it out but as we go on in the show, so where's your heart? You're known now among many people as being, you know, kind and, and generous and, and a bit vulgar, a bit straight up. Earthy, I prefer to. Earthy, earthy. is what he calls it. Earthy. Uh, where are you relative to God, your walk, your faith, uh, whatever it is? Uh, well, it's interesting that you say that because uh, I was I uh, I I've, I've been very reluctant to talk about my own relationship with God um, until this show. I think even in other shows that I've done, I'm, I kind of hold off. And and the reason I do that is um, I was you know at the time when I made God's Army. I mean, I was so public about my religious beliefs my relationship with God I mean to the extent where you know in New York City I'm opening the film and then the reporters from the Times or something comes to a testimony meeting that I'm giving and you know at some ward house and then they write about you know my testimony and and it's wow. um, and I um, and I was okay with that I was like okay cool it's all part of what mm -hmm. I you know my sense of mission at the time um, but it was interesting that uh, people felt like they could ask me anything. You know, it was it got to the point where um, people would just people I didn't know uh, they they felt like they knew me because they had seen my films. But, you know, I just barely meet them, and they'd be asking me such intensely personal questions mm -hmm. about my spirit, my relationship with God. And uh, in in a lot of ways, I kind of felt like you know, it's as if you just meet someone and start asking them about their sexual practices with their spouse. You know, it's mm -hmm. like. Yeah, uh, I started to feel that way where I was like, you know, like I didn't, like the most intimate relationship of my life, which was my relationship with God, mm -hmm. um, I was feeling like it was too open, it was too um, public. And then when I left the church and it became very much, you know, everybody wanted to know exactly why and exactly this, and, and, uh, and I obliged to a very large degree. Mm -hmm. Um, but in the past several years, yeah, I've really pulled back, and I've uh, um, I keep I keep my spiritual experiences to myself. Mm -hmm. um, in fact, my recent girlfriend, I, I realized that she didn't, you know, I don't think she even knew a certain part of me because I, mm. um, well, she didn't ask. But but it was but there, you know, it's that that relationship with God is very sacred to me. Mm. Um, and I've, I've also noticed, you know, the earthy thing, and I notice on, I, I have a, my ex-wife says about my, my persona on Facebook, you know, she's like, that's not you. You know, it's mm. like you're, you know, because I'll make jokes and I, you know, and, uh, and I love a good, you know, naughty word now and then. And, um, and I love to publicize my irreverence and, and, uh, um, but she said, you know, she goes, that's, that's, that's not you. And it's like, well, that's true. It's a part of me. But it's, but it, and a lot of it is to protect myself now because mm -hmm. I don't, you know, I don't, uh, um, just like I don't talk about my intimate relationships with, with women, <laughs> women, <laughs> with women. <laughs> uh, <laughs> I also don't <laughs> talk about my intimate relationship with God, you know. Yeah. It's like, uh, um, but I do, but, but you know, on this show and in this situation, um, and, and the interesting thing is a lot of ex-Mormons just assume that I'm an atheist, yeah. which I'm definitely not. You know, it's like, no, I'm, I, you know, and I, I assume that I don't, you know, that I'm not Christian, and, and I definitely am, you know. 
but to me, it's it's uh, it <clears throat> it's necessary. It's a necessary part of my spiritual life now to to keep it. To I think I've learned mm. to uh, keep it a little closer to myself mm. and and share it sparingly, mm -hmm. you know, and with reason because it uh, because of what it you know what it means. In fact, I w and sometimes I'll I'll. Uh, uh, it's happened twice here. I, um, you didn't mention this, but I, I'm, I feel I'm a, I'm a part of this community. After we met, and I really liked you, and I, you know, I was like I responded to your approach to scripture and to Christ and to religion, and uh, so I've, you know, for the past couple of years, I'm I'm a fairly regular person here, mm -hmm. but there have been times when I, you know, even even here, I hold back there was a there was a time here where uh, it was a Sunday and there was a woman who uh, and I love how you were just open and you know, somebody wanted to talk so you just let a woman come up and start speaking and she was obviously under some kind of duress and and uh, and in crisis and she was talking and and you eventually very tactfully and very gently you know got her to sit down and then afterwards, you called everyone together and just said, oh, we, you know, let's do a little circle of prayer and pray for the, our sister. This mm -hmm. is the first time she had come to my knowledge. And uh, um, I didn't want to participate in that mm -hmm. because I was like, I, I could already feel this amazingly powerful spiritual presence. And I was just like, I, you know, I'm going to start bawling like a baby right here. I can't do this. But um, I think Derek... Derek and Danita were here, and I was like, "All right, I'll, I'll do this." Um, and then I was there, and I just got out, you know, as quickly as I could because it was such a. Um, but to me now, spirit, those kind of experiences are like. Um, I don't want them to be public, you know. Mm. I don't want them to be. Mm. I want to. Uh, I want to have more of them, and I want my relationship mm -hmm. to continue to grow to be more, you know, intimate and, and deeper. Mm -hmm. But I feel like. Part of the requirement mm. for that to happen is for me to stop talking about it. Mm. You know, yeah. I mean, it's a, it's a fascinating. I, I I didn't really know this about Richard. I've known you're uh, you're reserved in many areas, and I know you're quiet. Um, but that's important, I think, what you've brought up for people because not everybody is a shout Jesus name, and not everybody is vocal about their faith. And some people are very quiet and reserved, but you know, uh, deep waters, they, they, they run deep. And, and I sense that about you. It comes through your films, comes through our friendship, even amidst our bodiness. I mean, I know you're uh, a man of God and, and I'm just grateful that you're here on the stage and you're, you're willing to, to, to share that with us. Uh, and, you're, and to voice that, I think that's really important. Again, Richard Dutcher collection available by going to, it's on the screen there. You can order uh, this and uh, some excellent movies and film. Can you get falling through your site? Not yet. Not no. yet. Not okay. Yet. Sure. Uh, you have some things in the work. Can you give us anything uh, on your professional side of, uh, or you want to? Yeah, well, I have a comedy coming that, that I'm finishing up called Boys at the Bar, and it's a, just a good, rowdy, earthy, Comedy. Earthy is the operative word tonight. Yes, earthy. That's my preference. Um, and then I'm I'm getting ready to do another. I've been doing a lot of writing for other directors and producers, and I'm getting ready to do my own film, which will be, you know, another earthy comedy. <laughs> and uh, and actually, one of the reasons that I'm doing this, um, I, the the better my films became, the 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 spiritually themed films. The less successful they were, um, and of course that was due partly to the dying of the Mormon market. But uh, I, I, last year I was able to do a, a Christian uh, project. Um, producers, they didn't even know I was Mormon. They just knew that I'd written some other sports movies and brought me this script. I was able to write this amazingly wonderful uh, script. So there's a that, that's being produced now. Um, so there's a great. Uh, Christian theme project that I was able to participate in, but one of the reasons I, I'm I'm doing more commercial things is so that I can afford to make these films that are so important to me, 
uh, because uh, I'm going to lose money on them, but I can't go to investors and say, hey, you want to make my movie about God that nobody's going to go see, right. you know? Yeah. Um, so instead I have to say, hey, let's make a movie about these drunk guys in a bar and it's going to make a bunch of money and I'm going to take some of that money and I'll go blow it on a movie about God. That's <laughs> kind of what, what I'm all about now. <laughs> Whatever it takes, I guess, right? Yeah. Uh, I was going to ask you something about, oh, will you ever um, revisit your passion for Joseph Smith? Oh, absolutely. I'd love to. Um, you have some unique views. You shared with me a couple years ago, I don't know if you still maintain them, about him. A lot of people come out of Mormonism, they're like, he's a this and he's a that. What are your insights? Because you really, you really looked into him. Oh, yeah. Yeah, no, I, uh, that's one of the reasons I, didn't, I couldn't make the film. Well, there's a whole other story. Someday maybe we should do a show about the, the, uh, the evil apostle who helped destroy my, uh, my uh, Joseph Smith film. But uh, that's I'm, the earth I'm one. still angry about that. Yeah. Um, but it had nothing to do with my leaving the church. Yeah. Should have, but it didn't. Um, but anyway, uh, yeah, I'd still love to make that. But the reason I've never been able to make it is because it's because I, I've approached it from a, you know, I did the research, and so I want to present the man the way that he really was, not the way that. Uh, so it falls in this interesting space where I've had, you know, I, the 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 devout rich Mormons won't support it because of course it goes into the reality of, of the situation of who he was and what happened um, but then the opportunity I had an opportunity a few years ago where a guy wanted me to was wanted to finance it but he wanted me to make Joseph Smith just this complete villain uh, you know racist he wanted to just and I, and I tried to explain to him it's like well that's not who he was and I'm not going to you know do that movie either you know, do the script that I wrote or you know I'm not gonna so I've fallen in this place where you know if I if I wanted to totally smear the man then I could get the money and if I wanted to do this if I wanted to go pretend that I was Mormon again and wanted to make this hagiographic hey, movie then I could do that but mm -hmm. I'm not I wanted so so that's probably another one where I'm gonna have to make a you know bunch of money doing mm -hmm. some horror movie and then run off and make my version of the Joseph Smith film mm -hmm. Which will piss off everybody, you know. Right. The, the devout Mormons will hate it. The anti-Mormons will hate it, and uh, but I'll like it. <laughs> and that's what's always seemed to matter to you. Yeah. That you like it. But he was uh, he was much more. I mean, that's the thing. I, I was just disabusing a, a guy recently who just came out of the church, and was started just you know going on and on about um, Joseph Smith. And so I said, okay, wait, well, yeah, yeah, you know. And I started to talk to him about you know the complexity of the man who he was, and, uh, and it really, you know, the guy's like, oh, I'd never thought about it that way, and uh, it's interesting that he gets, he gets, so, I mean, he was a fascinating person. Mm -hmm. Obviously, I don't believe that he was a prophet of God, mm -hmm. right? Obvi let's just get that out there right now, yeah. but I still find him this, I mean, here's a guy, here's a, this guy who was a, you know, a poor kid, and within, you know, 38 years, he rose to found a world, a powerful religion, a city. He ran for president. He pissed off the United States government to such a degree that they had him killed. Mm -hmm. I mean, it's like, um, it, it's a fascinating story, mm -hmm. you know, and bringing in, he, he became, his religion became such a threat to the United States, to the, to the republic, that he had to be put away. That's what most people don't realize is that he was the, he was one of the, he was the first assassination of a presidential candidate, mm -hmm. I mean the first uh, political assassination of a candidate, um, I believe in the history of the United mm. States. Uh, but, but of course it's not presented as a political assassination which is exactly what it was. But I guess that's a subject for another. <laughs> Rock Waterman was on here a few weeks ago and he uh, follows Denver Snuffer and his, the way he explains Smith is he believes he was part of the uh, Reformation. He was a Reformational leader who threw his hat in and added some things. What do you think on that thought? Well, yeah, he was obviously informed by the time, you know, the time period, that, <clears throat> that whole thing. I mean, everything that came into it, a lot of, I mean, you know, Mormonism was so, so influenced by, in, in its formation by everything else that was going on at the time. Um, but uh, but yeah, there was more. See, that's the thing. There's so much more to it. You know, the the cycle. You know, his psychology. You know, and his. Um, yeah, and I, I don't want to say too much about it because I think you know people say, oh, you know, you you can't figure this guy out. And it's like no, I think it's not that difficult to mm -hmm. figure out. Especially referring to my youth as a, I used to, my grand. All the Pentecostal preachers would come through our house because you know we'd feed them and 
and uh, got to know him. So I got to know some fascinating, mm. you know, country preachers. And uh, to me, Joseph Smith isn't that different from mm. some of these guys that I met. You know, sure. who would tell you right, you know, right across the green beans, you know, that they had that they had seen Jesus, and Jesus came into their bedroom and talked to them. And you know, here I'm a 12-year-old kid, and I'm fascinated. And it's like, well, you know, tell me about <laughs> Jesus and how. He, um, and these people, you know, could could uh, could spin a story until they believed it, and maybe you know, sure. and, could, and uh, but but there's that. There's the political stuff. There's the socioeconomic business. There. I mean, this is a fascinating. It really is. Uh, and it would make a hell of a movie. Just an absolute. I hope you sell movie. enough horror films to be able to make <laughs> it someday. Uh, one thing about that is, uh, you know, when, when you've been LES, we have a, a tendency to really thrash when you've left it, uh, Joseph Smith. But before you do that, and we, we've spent the last few years talking about this stuff, I have, I have sheets uh, as long as the ceiling to, of quotes from uh, Martin Luther that would shake you. I have uh, uh, volumes, not volumes, but I have a lot of quotes about uh, Calvin and what he has said about things too. So, you know, we got to be careful. It's not, he definitely, the church today, I want to barf about it and what they are all, all about. But the founder, I don't know that we can be as harsh on him as we have been and to be, f and be fair. I just don't, I just not sure. After you see what all men are about, um, not so sure. Do we have a call before we wrap this up? Yeah. Let's go to James from Spanish Fork. You're on Heart of the Matter with Richard Dutcher and Sean. Hi, yeah, I had a quick question. Yes. Yeah. Uh, I personally haven't done much study, so I'm kind of confused why he says that, uh, you know, like the works justify. So I was wondering if you could maybe clear that up for me. Well, uh, the best answer, James, actually is uh, read that second chapter of James. The context of it is James goes in and says, listen, if you think that you can have preferential treatment toward other people, you're wrong. You have to treat people equally. And then he goes on and he starts saying, remember, the whole chapter is about faith. It's about faith. It is not about works. It's about faith. Okay. And so he goes on, he talks about that, and then he gives those two examples. Let me tell you, faith without works is dead, and let me give you a couple examples. And he uses Abraham. And what was Abraham's sacrifice? It was showing that he had love for God. The first great commandment, love God. He uses Abraham. And then he uses Rahab as an example of faith uh, having works. What did Rahab do? She loved her neighbor. She saved her neighbor out of love. So if you look at those concepts and you read the second chapter of James, what you have is James saying, listen, if you say you have faith and you treat people preferentially because they're rich or you treat them badly because they're poor, you, aren't, you don't have the works, which is love. Loving God first, loving man second, in the evidences of the examples of Abraham and Rahab. So it's faith without love is dead. And that's an absolute truism. I mean, you show somebody who says, I believe in Jesus, and they turn around and they treat people horribly, I would too also question that faith that they have in Jesus. So that's what he's talking about. I see, I understand. Yeah. Hope that helps, my brother. Okay, God bless. Bye-bye. We have another call. Uh, can we get it? <laughs> she said no. <laughs> okay. Uh, we started late. We have a couple more minutes. We didn't get to do a wrap-up. Anything you'd like to say? We try to give everybody a final word. You don't have to talk about my greatness. You can... Look at that. No, I will say something um, that I, I feel. Uh, my grandmother, before she she knew that I sh she lived long enough to see me leave Mormonism, hmm. and she was distressed, even though she never really supported me in Mormonism. But but she said something that I put into one of my films where she said, you know, she'd say, you know. Uh, uh, it's better to be without a home than without a church. And, uh, and 
so the last time I saw her, when I was visiting her in, in Illinois, as I was saying goodbye, she said to me, she said, uh, have you found a church yet? Hmm. And I, at the time and where I was in my life, I w wanted to just say, hell no, hmm. I, you know, I didn't want anything to do with any churches. And so I just, but I kindly said, no, Grandma, I haven't found anything yet. And she said, well, I hope, you know, I hope you do. And uh, then a couple months later, she died. But uh, I really never thought that I would find a church again because I, I saw what organized religion had done to, you know, in my life. And, and I, the extricating myself from it was such a painful process. But I realized recently that, it, uh, you know, what you have here is very, it's not a brick and mortar church. You know, it's, it's believers getting together and, and talking about the word and um, and I just kind of fell in with this rowdy bunch here <laughs> and and slowly became very good friends with you know you and Wendy and Dave and Danny and Derek and Danita and everybody and um, at one point recently I just realized that uh, you know, if my grandma was still alive I could tell her I found a church so my brother. Oh, got to hold hands. Got to hold hands. He's very. Oh, I'm oh, sorry. <laughs> uh, but uh, but that's awesome. That's fantastic, and it's nice to have a. Uh, it's nice to have a, a community again. Mm -hmm. It's great to have you as part of it. Thank he you. brings a great flavor to everything, Richard Dutcher, and you know I'm I've grown by this uh, interview because. Uh, you know we kind of like to box people up and get us all acting the same way and. Dutcher is his own man. When you make your own films and you're an independent filmmaker and you've left Mormonism and all that stuff, he's his own man. And I think we need to remember that it, here at campus too. That people, even though they're not like everybody else or whatever, if they, whatever, they have their right and we love them. I hope that everybody who watches prays for our brother Richard Dutcher for his success in his filmmaking career, which is burgeoning, it's coming up, it's going, and we just pray that God will use him and his talents to bring more uh, entertainment and more product and more glory to, uh, to him. So thanks, Richard. Love you. Grateful thanks. that you came on tonight. I really appreciate it. We'll see you next week here on Heart of the Matter. I'm on a ride going nowhere. I am an existential cowboy on the wind and I won't be coming out I'm going this man's awake a storm's arising the dawn's awake